Okay, so we're going to do Naga City Curious again. This time we're going to go for the Hoarder badge, meaning we can't convert anything. And to make things a little more interesting, I'm going to be playing a Gorgon instead of a Sorcerer. Gorgon will have a lot less of the Sorcerer's raw power and spellcasting, so I won't have all of my usual advantages. But Gorgon isn't just a random arbitrary choice. Endeswall is a great glyph to start with because it means that we have some way of farming piety on Mystera right from the start. And in particular, in the Hoarder run, we don't have the option of just picking up a Wana fight or an Aphiel Seek or something like that on the floor to farm piety with. And we can't guarantee we'll have monsters available that we can farm with Burndaraz. So because of that, being able to start with an Endeswall, which is great for piety farming and that we're actually happy to still have with us when we get to the arena, is a huge boon. And because we're guaranteed to have Endeswall to farm piety with, I'm actually okay with starting without Burndaraz and prepping extra mana boosters instead. Gorgon doesn't have the Sorcerer's naturally high mana bar, so that extra advantage will help. And I think even if we explore two-thirds of the map before we find the Burndaraz, we'll still be able to get all the leveling we need. So I'm not too worried about that. The other difference in preps from the usual approach is Slayer Wand, because everything else at the Blacksmith would clog up our inventory. Even a Perseverance badge in Naga City Curious, often one small item slot ends up making a big difference in term because you want to be able to use up some small items to reduce your small items to one row to allow you to start buying items from the shops down there. So even Perseverance Badge wouldn't be as useful, wouldn't be worth the inventory space it takes. Slayer Wand isn't actually particularly useful for us at all. But it's better than nothing, so why not? And it's the only blacksmith option that's better than nothing. Alright, here we're attacking a different monster to pop the burning stack, which gets the goo blob down low enough that we can death gaze it. So I guess it's kind of worth talking about. Uh, Gorgon, as I said, was partly to make this run more challenging. But it's not just a completely random, we've, we're going to take a bad class to use Codex on and then use Codex anyhow. Gorgon actually works pretty well with this. A lot of Gorgon's usual weaknesses we can completely ignore. Gorgon has low attack bonus, naturally. We don't make physical attacks, so we don't care. Gorgon uh, has not a very good conversion bonus. We're going for Hoarder, meaning we're never going to get any conversion bonuses, barring some weird stuff with, like, if we somehow end up taking Chaos Avatar. So that drawback doesn't matter either. And Gorgon's strengths actually help us quite a lot. One, she's got physical resistance to start with, and we can make great use of that. The more I do Naga City Curious, the more I feel like what we really want is two mana items and one defensive item and the 25% physical resist is sort of like a pseudo defensive item so that puts us off to a good start. Additionally her death gaze is extremely handy for finishing off fights with one fewer fireball than needed. Often we can fireball a monster then attack someone else to pop the burning stack and then that will make the monster low enough that death gaze can apply and kill them. Between Gorgon's naturally low attack power and the Mysterious Flames boon, reducing our attack bonus as well, our attack bonus is going to be something like minus 60% or something, but attack bonus doesn't apply to Death Gaze. It's always treated as 100%, regardless of what your bonus actually is, which means we don't care about any of those negative stacks. Now, if we take weakness from a Naga, that we're going to care about. Being able to kill level 7s as a level 4 is about where you want to be with Avatar's Codex. And Gorgons make particularly nice targets because they're pretty squishy and we're actually immune to their death gaze, not that it matters that much.
So we're leveling quite smooth smoothly here. I haven't bought much except I picked up the uh, soul orb as soon as I found it because there's no way immunity to mana burn isn't going to be super good for us. And the sub dungeon turns out to be the metal spider temple. Now, I haven't been to the metal spider temple in more than a year when I did this run. I vaguely remember that you can get the two salves to remove all the weakness and corrosion you get and the can of Wupaz as well, so you actually make a profit. But I've never been there with Endoswall before, so I wasn't sure what I could and couldn't do. And, like, the closest thing I've done to Metal Spider Temple recently is the uh, Spider's Curse Curious for Everfrost Peak. So I've gotten myself poisoned because I'm pretty sure I remember this place poisoning me anyhow. Uh, so it seems like a good time to come here. Now, because I was low on health, that does mean that when I put all my health and mana into the uh, Essence Potion, it's not going to restore all of my health, only part of it. What's What I think is kind of interesting is Essence Potion stored 15 mana for me, but it didn't actually make me lose the 15 mana I had. And I think that's because it doesn't actually make you lose mana when you make the Essence Potion. Not in the way that, say, Blood to Power makes you lose health. Instead, it just applies Mana Burn. And as a consequence of applying Mana Burn, you happen to lose all your mana. But we bought the Soul Orb earlier, which I was... I forgot I had that, so I was keeping surprised that it hasn't uh, Mana Burned me. So I, at this point, I'm just thinking, oh, I guess Mana Burn isn't one of the effects of... This place, but that's what's really going on. Every step I take, the Spider Temple's trying to mana burn me, and the Essence Potion also tried to mana burn me. And luckily, the Essence Potion still st records that I spent 15 mana on it, even though I didn't lose the mana. So because of Endoswall, we were able to get a lot more goodies than usual. In addition to the two salves and the can of Wupaz, we were able to pick up two seals. One for shrinking, which we immediately used on the Avatar's Codex. That's great for a hoarder run to free up inventory space. And one for stealing an item, which gold tends to be pretty tight when you're in the upstairs area of Naga City. The arena is quite the opposite. So those are... Very good items. I would say that's a great sub-dungeon to find. A little setup, we can go after monsters three levels higher than us this still. Burn Vipers normally aren't very good targets for a codex build, but since we've got the soul orb, we don't care. Unfortunately, I seem to have forgotten that and I'm going after regular snakes instead. But it's okay. I've got a bit of a bad habit of forgetting my soul orb. We're still getting pretty good targets. I'm using Endoswall to break into the wall darkness and then exploring into it, which is a net negative in terms of mana, but it's a net positive in terms of Mystero Piety, and that's what I'm really concerned with. There's enough monsters remaining that I think definitely the way to go is take this level up and try to get to the end of level 8 before we go on to the arena. Sometimes I've gone down as level 7, especially if Vicious Token is prepped, you're kind of forced into that a lot of the time. But if you can get the XP for it, being able to go down at the end of level 8 instead, it feels much, much better. I 
we want to get as much Mystera piety as possible before we go downstairs, so thinking hard about where which walls to break to get the most refund from Mystera. And we also wanted to find the secret sub-dungeon, which this was the only place it could really be. Not sure this is the best secret sub-dungeon for us, but it's fine. It certainly feels better than finding good Glenric when you're already a higher level than him. Getting near 100 in piety, which means I should probably be thinking about buying another boon from Mystera. Additionally, you'll notice we have 17 max mana, and that's two from Mystera boons and five from the boosters, because we prepped extra boosters. 18 would be a good number to have, because that's where mana potions increase from five each to six each. But, so between that and us having high piety, really the thing we should be doing is spending 45 piety to get a third extra mana max from Mystera. I don't think that's going to happen. This is me reading the uh, Metal Spider Temple signpost just because I'm curious about spider lore. It has nothing to do with actually winning the run whatsoever. I want to get to exactly 39 out of 40 XP, because I want as much XP as possible without using up my level up. And that seems extremely doable. Shadowfroid Potion normally isn't my highest priority in uh, the arena because I'd much rather have something that provides continuous value than something that only provides value once because the game is so long. But these shops are really quite slim pickings for us. We don't have Crystal Ball, we don't have Dragon Soul, we don't have Plate Mail. None of the usual big items that we're really interested in are spawning for us, so that's a little unfortunate. Luckily, we do have Soul Orb, we do have Witchlock Pendant, and between our starting Physical Resist and Witchlock Pendant, that's a pretty good defensive item. And uh, thanks to our Translocation Seal, we can at least pick up that Keg of Health. Again, it's a consumable, so it's not really our highest priority in the arena, but the alternative is getting one Death Protection from the Badge of Honor, and there's no question about whether it's more valuable to have enough health potions to heal 120% of your health or just one death protection. I guess there could be a bit of a question about that if you can't even survive a single hit from Bleedy even at full health, but we've got so much physical resist that's not going to be an issue. Maybe if I just keep rechecking the shops I'll find something better, but... Keg of Health is the only really useful thing for us. Slayer Wand is going to consume itself so I can pick up one more thing and still have room in my inventory to buy items in the arena shops. There's not really anything here I'm too keen on though. Biceps is a really bad way of stripping resists. His orf and Lemmy. Let me see, we're not going to use much, especially let me see is terrible once we've taken Mystic Balance. I'll pick up Pizorp just because it's better than nothing, and it seems slightly more plausibly usable than the other options. Maybe I could like push a plant out of my way or something. I'm going to spoil the surprise ending here and say Pizorp does not get cast a single time in the entire run. Here I am, dutifully using Wait What to attack the Tormented One without getting mana burned, having already forgotten once again that I am immune to mana burn due to the Soul Orb. All 
Alright, we're getting several magic resistors here. The Cursed Shade, Lord Gob the Goblin Ward, Lord, and It's Sama. And uh, now one of the golems as well. So this is a great wave to take a few layers of the weakening boon. It's too bad we didn't get the second golem as magic resist golem as well. You really need several layers of weakening to get rid of to deal with them. And being able to deal with both of them with a single several layers of weakening is really nice. Now that I've explored pretty much everywhere the Cursed Shade can actually blink to, I'm going after them first. We didn't get a mana sustain item when we were upstairs. We didn't get a crystal ball. We didn't get a dragon soul. We didn't even find a mage armor for the max mana to make our mana potions that much better. So having dragon soul for sustain as soon as possible is really important to us. Which is why Cursed Shade was such a high priority. Going after Cursed Dragon next. Attacking the little dragon spawn to pop the burning stack, which puts the dra Cursed Dragon in Death Gaze range. And I've been hit by the Cursed Dragon several times, so I'm expecting to be cursed. And right now I'm really confused about why I'm not. And this is where I actually figure out how Cursed Dragon and Cursed Shade work. I've noticed by now that Cursed Dragon tends to spawn in the top center of the arena, whereas it the other monsters I didn't really see much of a pattern before, Cursed Shade seems to be top left as well. So, obviously, in Cursed Oasis, the way they work is when you kill the Cursed Shade, Cursed Dragon can't curse you anymore. And the same thing is true here. They always spawn in the same wave, in the top and top center and top left positions. And once you've picked up the Dragon Soul dropped by the Cursed Shade, the Cursed Dragon loses Curse Bearer. Other creatures with Curse Bearer like Tomothy Longdoll won't, but the Cursed Dragon will. So that's just a really neat little interaction, and I didn't know it was happening there, but this is where I look, figure out that that's what's going on. Seems like a good time for a Schadenfreude Potion. I'm having to burn through a lot of potions here, which is a little worrying. This is where we're kind of starting to feel the fact that Gorgon, even though it does synergize a lot better with Avatar's Codex than you'd expect, especially on a Hoarder run, it really doesn't have the raw power that, say, a Sorcerer Gnome or Sorcerer Elf does for this type of build. So I'm hoping that we uh, have enough sustain to get us through to the end. Finding the Dragon Soul on the first act instead of the third was really important for us. Without that, I don't think we would have a good shot. I'm gonna level up with Death Gaze, so I may as well spend mana and open up the map a little more. To act two. Between acts we basically get a full refill because we have to walk all the way down. I'm gonna do sort of like this little sideways walk thing so I can take down a couple walls of the path on the way there just to open up a little more darkness for later this wave or wave three. 
It doesn't really cost me any mana because I'm getting back up to full mana from walking down the long dark anyhow. That golem was the easy one with physical resist, so that almost always just goes down in three hits. Indomitable, we can strip two layers of death protection off of with every attack because when it's at 1 HP from death protection, our death gaze is able to make us hit twice per attack. And once it's low on death protections, its attack power is low enough that that becomes a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, I took a couple layers of weakening there. That was a bit of a mistake. Anubis Phase 1 is around, and Steno hasn't gotten her resistances yet. Really, it would be best to get to Anubis Phase 2, who has magic resist, and have uh, kicked Steno in the face before we buy the weakenings, but just a little lost value there. Luckily, Anubis Phase 2 isn't too powerful, and Steno certainly isn't. She'll usually go down in four fireballs no matter how many resists she gets. But with the other 75% resist golem around, we did have to get weakening at some point this wave. I desecrated Tiki Tuki there. That's not completely free, like it is for Sorcerer, because even though negative attack bonus from things like Flames don't make our death gaze worse, Negative base damage from weakening does hurt our death gaze, so in the long run that is sacrificing our uh, death gaze potential, but that's just something we're going to have to deal with. We needed piety, and our usual desecration of bin lore is not really possible here because we would lose our base resistance. Lovely enough, cures the poison, which is why I went for the snake at that particular time. We're again getting to the end of the darkness on this wave, and we still have four monsters to go, five if you include Anubis 3 separately, which is a little concerning, especially since Frank the Zombie and the Magic Resist Golem are two very strong monsters. The Magic Resist Golem, we've at least bought enough uh, layers of weakening that it shouldn't be too bad, but Frank the Zombie just has a lot of hit points. And it doesn't really matter how good we are at surviving the hits from him. If he's got that many hit points, then... Luckily we were... In fact, he's got so many hit points, one of our can of Wupazes could be used on him. This is why we're really happy we found the Spider Temple. Uh, normally, Kanapupaz is reserved for the Super Meat Man, who is the same problem as Frank, except he's even fatter. But since we had a second one from that sub-dungeon, we had one to use on Frank as well, so that's convenient. Gonna eat another Yendor. The resources we need to deal with Anubis. We're really pinched for black space here, and I started to think maybe the correct play was to use a mana potion or two on the first wave to break some walls up north and then explore them. It would cost us very little mana to open up a lot more of the map, 
And considering how much extra mana it would let us restore by exploring in later waves, I think it would pay off in the long run. Luckily, after the first entanglement, I realize I'm immune to mana burn. I don't need to keep playing around it. Opening up the map is nice, but since it's the third and final wave, we're not going to be getting too much profit out of it. This should really have been done sooner. It's my old friend Super Meat Man. Now, Super Meat Man is actually one of the few places in this dungeon where we actually use physical attacks woven in with are fighting as opposed to just to pop burning stacks or as a death gaze at the end. Under normal circumstances, that would mean we could actually take advantage of Gorgon's poison ability, which we've otherwise been not using at all. But that doesn't seem to be happening, and it took me a moment to realize the reason for that is we desecrated Tiki Tuki earlier. The main effects of desecrating Tiki Tuki are, of course, giving all of your enemies first strike and weakening blow, but the fine print says that you also lose all of your poison, and I think dodge chance as well, which is not something I ever actually remembered. A very rare physical attack there to get Medusa down into Death Gaze range, and that really goes to show just how starved we're starting to be for mana regen opportunities. You may be immune to curses, but Tomothy applies poison and, uh, or you may be immune to mana burn, but Tomothy applies poison and curse bearer as well. So still useful to fight him with the help of Earth Mother to make sure that doesn't happen. And we kill him just before Bleedy so that we can immediately remove the curse stack. Rex finally gets our attention. If we hadn't taken so much weakening from Tiki Tuki, we could have saved Fireball there using our Death Gaze, but that is not the world we are living in. Actions have consequences. A 
All right, only one boss left. And it's our old nemesis, Gatana to fix. Or something to that effect. I really don't want them to be able to spawn plants, because then Earth Mother would get really mad at me for punching them, and I wouldn't be able to slow Gatana to fix to make the corrosion not matter, because again, Earth Mother would be really mad at me. I do have mana burn immunity, so I could convert to Mystera Anur and deal with it that way, but Honestly, I'm happy to just keep taking the refills from Earth Mother. And that's the last wave. All that remains is the Prince. Who is not much of a challenge. And we've done it. We used all nine of the arena shops. And only had a few potions left over at the end. So that really came down to the wire. We had a great sub dungeon, but not so great shops. And... Considering that Gorgon is not the strongest Codex user in the game, I'm very happy that we were able to turn that into a win, even though Hoarder might not seem like the hardest uh, badge to go for. Naga City Curious means that even the easiest runs can be uh, quite difficult, and this was by no means the easiest. Uh, Pizorf, of course, continues to have never been used. Another successful run. And without relying on sorcerer's raw power is a crutch. <laughs>